Hi to the organizers of today's event. Um, today's event has been made a commitment to creating a multilingual space. To that end, we have the interpretation available into Spanish and English. The event will be held in Spanish, English bilingually. We ask that all participants speak slowly and loud and clear into their microphones to make that interpretation easier. Please ensure when the function is activated that you select English or Spanish on the little globe. Otherwise, you will not be able to hear the English interpretation when a Spanish speaker uh, talks. Hola a los organizadores del evento de hoy. Tiene la firme determinación de crear un espacio multilingüe y con este fin contamos con interpretación disponible en inglés y español. El evento se relacionará en inglés, español, de forma bilingüe. Les pedimos a todos los participantes que hablen despacio y en voz alta y clara en sus micrófonos para facilitar la interpretación. Dentro de unos minutos vamos a activar la interpretación para este evento y si usted está usando la aplicación Zoom, podrá ver el icono de un mundo en la parte de abajo de la pantalla. Haga clic en el mundo para escuchar la interpretación y seleccione entre inglés y español. Si tiene algún problema con, al respecto, por favor escriba en el comentario del chat. Thank you, Erwin. No problem. And we are right at time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Hi, I'm Calvin Allen. I work with an organization called Rural Forward North Carolina. Uh, we are a program of a large organization called the Foundation for Health Leadership and Innovation, and really excited to be your moderator for this evening. Uh, wanted to let you know, as Erwin was just saying, that uh, translation services are available. So if you look at the bottom uh, of your screen uh, with the menu in Zoom, there is a globe there that's around translation, uh, and you can click on that to hear in either English or Spanish. So that is there if you need it uh, at any point throughout the night. And also just wanted to take note that a recording of this session is being made and it will be available in both English and Spanish uh, later on in the week. And so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're excited tonight to be joined by Jessica Holmes and Josh Dobson, both running for Commissioner of Labor. Uh, Steve Troxler and Jennifer Wadsworth, both running for Commissioner of Agriculture. Jen Mangrum, running for Superintendent of Public Instruction. And Yvonne lewis Holly ru running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we want to thank you all for being a part of this forum. And starting off with the obvious here, food, farms, hunger relief, um, they're all baselines for each of us. Um, COVID-19 has really amplified the issues faced by our specific communities, but also the systems that link all of us. Um, that's why we're hearing from candidates on these vital issues uh, and why doing that is so important. What is their experience with food systems issues? How do they propose we address community issues and community deficits with equity in mind? How can we build upon our farming and food assets? And how do they each propose, especially in this time of amplified needs that all people are fed and that those who supply that amazing food that we eat have the resources and supports they need for sustainability. All of us who are part of this today are one of over 370 people that registered for this event and we anticipate more joining us um, over the evening. In November, we'll all have the chance uh, to vote for who can best answer these questions in North Carolina. And that's why the organizers planned this conversation with candidates. It's to provide a virtual nonpartisan candidate forum to hear state level candidates discuss important issues related to food, farming, and hunger in our state. The next slide uh, shows the planning team and the organizing agencies. Moms Rising, the North Carolina Rural Center, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, Feeding the Carolinas, the North Carolina Alliance for Health, Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina, the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina, and the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA. Regarding our agenda for tonight, uh, in just a few minutes, we're, we'll start with quick candidate introductions. The bulk of our time will be spent asking each of the candidates 
five questions on food, farms, and hunger that emerged from your feedback. We'll provide an opportunity for closing statements from each of the candidates, and we'll see some real-time feedback from you through some quick polling we'll do right at the end of the evening session. And we'll adjourn at 8.30 p.m. Um, we ask you to keep notes on how this format works. We all know that this is not how we planned it, um, but we all are adjusting to uh, COVID-19 and this change in circumstance. At the end of the session, a link will appear automatically for some quick evaluation. Uh, it'll also be sent to your email addresses um, after the session has ended too. Um, but if you're like me, I know I wanna go ahead and get it done. Um, so that link will be there, but if you wanna do it tomorrow, that option is there too. With that, let's talk just a little bit about the guidelines. Um, I'm gonna seek responses to those five questions on farms, food, and hunger from each of the candidates. Um, they will each have 90 seconds to respond. Prior to the event, the order in which the candidates would receive and respond to questions was randomly selected and sent to the candidates. Candidates are not gonna have the opportunity for rebuttal. Uh, candidates are asked to limit their responses to the subject matter of the questions asked and refrain from personal attacks against other candidates. If necessary, I'll step in. Uh, a timekeeper, my colleague, Phil Sheldon, um, will alert individual candidates directly through Zoom chat when their response time is nearing an end. Due to the limits of this format, live questions from the audience were not possible but you submitted questions when you registered for the event. Those submissions were considered in the selection of the final list of questions uh, overall. Each candidate will have a minute for a closing statement and then the event will be recorded through Zoom and again, shared on social media and in special uh, email communications, again, in English and in Spanish. With that, I think it's time for some opening statements. So to our candidates, we thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening. Um, I'll now ask each of you to introduce yourself, including your name, where you live, what office you're seeking, and why farms, food, and hunger matter in North Carolina today. Um, looking at the candidate response order, Jennifer Wadsworth, would you start us off? Hey y'all, my name is Jenna Wadsworth and I'm the Democratic nominee for North Carolina Commissioner of Agriculture. I wanna start by thanking the organizers for putting this very important forum together tonight for all of the voters and people who are involved in the industry. And for the last 10 years, I've been elected in Wake County as the Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor, uh, a role that I've been proud to serve in for the 1.2 million people who call this county home. Uh, since we made history with my first election in 2010 when I became the youngest woman ever elected to any political office in the state. And I share that because I think it's important to realize that young people are not just the future. We're capable of making real meaningful change in our community starting today. And that's something I've been doing for the past decade. Uh, and in particular, serving our farmers in Wake County despite intense developmental pressures. And I'm really proud of my work co-authoring the county's agricultural and economic development plan that gave our farmers a viable pathway to market so that way they could continue doing what they love to do, which is farm. And for those who, you know, maybe aren't familiar with my candidacy, I want to let you know that running for this office is also very personal to me. So I grew up on a hog cow, chicken, corn, cotton, tobacco, and soybean farm on a dirt road in Johnson County. My earliest memories are on the farm. Uh, and I'm still very much involved in the operations of that farm with my father to this day. And I think that agriculture holds the key to addressing some of the biggest issues that we're facing in society right now, be they addressing climate change, food insecurity, feeding our children, talking about our farm workers and farm laborers, addressing social justice and environmental justice and economic justice. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Jenna. And sorry, we've got your name wrong up there. Uh, Josh Dobson. Yeah, in, in, in addition to what Jenna said, I also want to thank the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, the Feeding the Carolinas, the North Carolina Alliance for Health, Moms Rising, the North Carolina Rural Center, and the Rural Advancement Foundation International for putting on this very important forum. My name is Josh Dobson. I'm currently in the State House. I live in McDowell, but also represent Avery and Mitchell counties in the far western part of the state. Uh, I am running for North Carolina Commissioner of Labor. 
I've thought a lot about why food, farming, and hunger matter. You know, it doesn't matter which part of our state you're from. If you don't have enough food to eat, you can't perform at a high level at school, and you can't perform at a high level at work. Representing a poor rural district, I see what hunger does to kids and the effects it has on families. As chair of health policy and appropriations, I promoted policies that address health disparities, food deserts, and health inequities. That same type of non-ideological problem-solving approach I've had in the House is the same mindset I'll bring to the Department of Labor. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here tonight, and I look forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Josh. Jen Mangrum. Hi, thank you. Yes, thank you to everyone who's put this on. I feel uh, very fortunate to be here tonight. Uh, I am running for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. I have been a classroom teacher for over 33 years, currently at a university helping our next generation of teachers come along. But I've spent 14 years in an elementary school. Um, I'm here tonight because my role includes not only the academic uh, support for our children, but their emotional, social, and physical well-being. I want schools to really focus on the whole child, the needs of the child, and how do we help them grow to be happy, healthy human beings. I think it's obscene that we can put a missile across the world within three feet and we can't feed our children. If there is one child in North Carolina who's going hungry, I feel as though I'm not doing my job. I'm looking forward to the rest of the um, forum and to hear the ideas of other people because this is so important and we got to do it right. So thank you. Thank you. Jessica Holmes. I reiterate my appreciation and gratitude to all of the hosts for giving us this opportunity to share. I am Jessica Holmes. I was born and raised in rural Eastern North Carolina, and I'm currently a Wake County Commissioner running for North Carolina Commissioner of Labor. Um, this issue is particularly near and dear to my heart as someone who grew up on free and reduced price lunch and who oftentimes through my childhood fit into the category of, of those children within our public school systems who have experienced hunger and what it's like at the end of the month to open the refrigerator and only essentially see condiments um, in a state that is one of the top producing agricultural economies in our entire country. Um, this issue matters to me and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share some of the issues that I have led on in addressing this issue, not from a theoretical perspective, but of actually ensuring that children and people in our communities actually have food that goes from the farm directly to our table. Thank you so much, Jessica. Steve Truxell. Are you there? We might be having a little problem with Steve. Let's go on to Yvonne Holly. Well, thank you everyone for this wonderful um, opportunity to talk about something that's so near and dear to my heart. And I say that it's been near and dear to my heart because when I first entered the North Carolina General Assembly, I was the one that brought food deserts to the attention of my colleagues um, because I had recently lost a couple of grocery stores in my community and found out that what was as important in my district was even more important and uh, the situation was worse in other areas, especially some of the more rural parts of the state. And I worked very diligently um, the whole eight years that I've been in the North Carolina General Assembly representing District 38, which is part of Raleigh, in introducing them to food and making sure the communities get to be food secure. And that uh, there is enough food available for everyone. Because if you are hungry, you can't work. If you're hungry, you can't, you can't go to school and, and, and think well. And it's just too an important part for a state like North Carolina 
to have the wonderful, wonderful agricultural system that it does. And then yet we come in so low in, in being able to feed our students. Uh, it has gone up, it is better, but it's still not there yet. So I uh, welcome the opportunity to talk about food security tonight and some of the things that I've done in the General Assembly and let's, uh, let's, let's get this started. Thank you. Steve Troxler. Calvin, can you hear me now? I can. All right. I'm Commissioner of Agriculture Steve Troxler, and I want to welcome you to my home and my farm here in Brown Summit, North Carolina, about 10 miles north of Greensboro. Uh, and I have been your Commissioner of Agriculture for the past four terms. It's been an incredible honor to do that. And I'm seeking my fifth term for this office. Uh, Agriculture and agribusiness remain the number one industry in North Carolina at 92.7 billion, that's with a B. Uh, and I've taken great pride in seeing this number grow from 59.6 when I walked in the door uh, of the Commissioner of Agriculture. During this time, I've been afforded the opportunities to be in regional leadership and national leadership serving as the president of uh, the National Association of State Department of Agriculture, the president of the Southern Association of State Departments of Agriculture, and a two-term uh, president of SURPASS, uh, an organization of the military, environmental groups, and state and federal agencies. So I'm glad to join you and look, like, uh, look forward to the conversation tonight. Great. Thank you. And now that we've heard uh, who everybody is, let's get into the, the major questions here. The topics are going to be around the, uh, the following issues, food insecurity and hunger, child nutrition programs, uh, supporting black farmers, farm workers, food processing, and issues facing Latino and Latinx populations, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And the first question, uh, which will go to Josh Dobson, is this one. North Carolina is the 10th most food insecure state in the country, while at the same time being the 10th most agriculturally productive state in the nation. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted weaknesses in our food systems, which we have also seen with natural disasters such as hurricanes in past years. What solutions will you offer to create a resilient food system that nourishes all North Carolinians in the face of future emergencies? Thank you for the question, Calvin. You know, there, the, these consequential and monumental problems that we face as a state, there, there are no silver bullets. There are no quick fixes to the problems that we face. But what we can do is offer policies that address those issues that you just mentioned. Uh, in this last COVID bill that we passed in the state house, we added $6 million to the food banks in North Carolina, 1 million for each one of the food banks. I think that's a start. Uh, we addressed health disparities in our state. We increased rural health grants, which allowed uh, homeless shelters to pay a physician's assistant to provide health care to those areas. Those are the types of things. I also sponsored Carolina Cares, which was a way of closing the coverage gap in North Carolina. So there is no silver bullet, but there are things that have been done in the state house, house to address this, this area and this issue of uh, food inequities in North Carolina. Thank you, Josh. One quick note is that, um, you know, this is Zoom. We're having a few problems with translation. So we do want to let people know that uh, we're doing the best we can to kind of try and fix the issues. If we can't fix those issues, we'll make sure that there's a translation of the entire session uh, by the end of, um, of the week. Uh, and then next up, Jessica, Jessica Holmes. I will note um, very specifically, as someone who grew up in rural Eastern North Carolina, who knows what it's like to sweep water out of our living room after hurricanes. Um, you can't talk about farm preservation, particularly in Eastern North Carolina, without talking about climate change. And the fact that due to climate change, we are seeing hurricanes at greater frequency and greater intensity as well. So that is something that we have to acknowledge and address when we talk about um, 
natural disasters such as hurricanes. Um, another issue that we have to be realistic about is farm preservation. Um, as our population continues to grow, um, development is putting pressure. Um, so we have to work with our farmers to make sure that they are able to continue farming in light of pressures related to um, development. Um, I would agree with Mr. Dobson that there is no silver bullet, but there are absolutely policies and initiatives that we can put in place to better support our farmers and ensuring that they're able to keep farms in their families. Thank you, Jessica. Steve Troxler. After every disaster that we've had in North Carolina since I've been the commissioner, we have responded with USDA food through our food distribution uh, division in Butner, North Carolina. And uh, it makes you feel so good to be able to get this food in. I know in uh, Florence, we were able to get food into Wilmington when nobody else could. We work with organizations like Baptist Home Mission to feed people during disasters, but we also deliver food to the food banks in North Carolina and the feeding institutions and the schools. And I'm proud to say that this past year, we delivered over $130 million worth of USDA food, which is an all time record for what we've done. But we also have got some new programs that we're gonna bring in to make sure that we have a resilient food uh, economy in North Carolina first. We have $20.4 million that we'll be investing in harvest capacity at our uh, smaller harvest plants and medium-sized harvest plants where animals are prepared and, and brought to the, the table. Uh, we think this will help a lot of small producers and medium-sized producers sell directly to the, the public. We have a, uh, we have a program called uh, our uh, farm uh, feeding program where uh, people sell directly to the public. Also, we're gonna be working with RAPI and with Carolina Farm Stewardship on a program that will help our smallest farmers markets in North Carolina. We have $750,000 to do that. I look forward to distributing this money. Thank you. Jenna Wadsworth. Building a more resilient food system won't only benefit our farmers, it'll benefit communities throughout the state. And so in North Carolina, our whole population is actually several percentage points higher um, when it comes to food insecurity than, than the U.S. population. And that's an even higher number for our children, with one in five children in North Carolina not knowing where their next meal is coming from. And when we talk about COVID-19, I think it's just highlighted exa and exa further exacerbated existing disparities within our very broken food system. Uh, Again, four out of 10 Black and Hispanic families right now are struggling with food insecurity during COVID-19. Uh, people are out of work at record rates and they're having to rely on food banks and nonprofit partners at unprecedented uh, rates in North Carolina. And it's been really amazing to watch some of these nonprofit partners step up, but it's unfair to ask them to continue operating at that level when we have other tools and resources available to us that we're just not using effectively. So I actually uh, pushed for legislation that became Senate Bill 776 that would have helped to make a more resilient food system here in North Carolina and would have helped benefit farmers with a tax credit to donate their food to nonprofit partners and get that food to where it needed to go. However, there were people in the legislature that were unable to put aside partisan ideology in order to create policy that would actually make a difference in people's lives. Lives. And I think that we absolutely can do better by investing in small and local food systems by working with federal partners to extend the minimum benefit for SNAP. And for every one person that Feeding America could feed, SNAP could feed nine if we fix that program to, to be more effective. Thank you. Uh, Jen Mangrum. Hi, thank you. Um, as I'm reading the question, we're the 10th most food insecure state in the country at the same time being the 10th most agriculturally productive state in the nation. How does that happen? As the superintendent, I'm thinking the math here doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, what I would say is that children should not live in areas where there are farms next door and yet they don't have food to eat. Uh, your comment about uh, climate change, 
are we teaching climate change in our schools? I'm not sure that we're getting enough science, particularly in the elementary school, to understand what that means and what that impact is on our daily lives. Um, our future generations need to be studying it, need to be knowing it, and that's important. I'm also thinking about our high school students when they're trying to pick their passion. What do they want to do in life? Um, we need to have more technical education, including agricultural education. And I've talked at length with this with Jenna. Um, you know, how do we expand it so that our students know that college isn't everybody's route? Some people want to follow a passion that that's different, and I want to be able to to provide that for them. Um, I think that the last thing I would say is education should be project-based and where better can we have hands-on learning than gardens in our schools or working on farms or being out in the public so as superintendent those are some of the things i want to do to help during uh, times of crisis and to help our students be prepared for them for the future so thank you thank you and yvonne holly well it's always difficult to go last when everybody has said so much wonderful things that, uh, to really answer this question so I will add uh, what I can. Well, first of all, we need to have an emergency system set up. Of course, our food banks are just an integral part of that. And we need to have delivery systems uh, in place. Instead of uh, us looking and sending so much out of state, when we have an emergency, we need to have contracts where maybe the eastern part of the state and provide things for the western part of the state if they have an emergency uh, and, and vice versa, a system that's in place. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that a food desert is when if you're in the urban area where you do not have access to nutritious food within a mile. But in rural areas, it's as much as 20, 25, and in some places, even 30 miles before you will have access to a grocery store. And just because you live on the farm doesn't mean you're food secure, because that farm may be a tobacco farm or it may be a um, not offer all the nutrient rich foods or variety of the foods that you need. So that too is something that we need to take a look at. Uh, I was instrumental in getting uh, the corner store initiative in which brought nutrient rich food, which is bringing nutrient rich foods to convenience stores and small stores and mom and pop stores uh, in uh, pro predominantly in the eastern part of North Carolina, where they had been hit the hardest by some of the hurricanes. That's only a sample of what can be done. We need to do more of that across the state and set up a system that uh, of checks and balances for these emergency kind of situations. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the second question, um, which is, you know, before COVID-19, one in five North Carolina children lived in food insecure households. Feeding America now estimates that nearly 30% of our children are food insecure, lacking consistent access to healthy, affordable foods. What actions will you take in your respective office to better support child nutrition programs in serving fresh, nutritious meals to all children in the state? We'll ask Jessica Holmes to start us off. Many people can talk about child hunger or food insecurity from a textbook perspective. I am someone who can speak to it from a lived experiences perspective, which is why when I made history in 2014, being the youngest county commissioner ever elected in Wake County's history, one of the first initiatives that I put forward was to put food pantries in high poverty high schools and middle schools all across Wake County. Um, one of um, each of these pantries not only includes non-perishable goods, but a refrigerator and a deep freezer, including fresh fruit, vegetables, as well as meat. Um, as um, Jen Mangum mentioned, I very much support um, community gardens. We've also been very proactive in ensuring um, universal breakfast at our high poverty elementary schools in particular, and also supporting our nonprofit community um, and doing the work that they do very well by ensuring they have the funding to do what they need to do. Um, organizations such as Backpack Buddies, getting you know those into the hands of our students. I very much believe we need to put the food where people are. Um, and that also comes into account when we're addressing things like food deserts. Um, I love things like farmers markets and putting those farmers markets um, and supporting our farmers, particularly in areas like food deserts. 
I always challenge my colleagues um, when it comes to addressing food security. It's not something that you can do one time and think you're done. It's something that you have to build a comprehensive and sustainable plan because just because you ate today and are full um, doesn't mean you won't be food insecure tomorrow. So sustainability is very important for our economy and for our farmers. Thank you. Jen Mangra. Thank you. Um, this isn't necessarily a food problem. It's a values problem. Um, I had a student, Chisholm, years ago, who at the end of the day, I found food stuffed in the back of his desk. And it was there later finding out because he was a, a foster child. And he was always afraid, where will my next meal come from? And so, you know, we see this in our schools and then we send them, you know, 900,000 children are getting breakfast and lunch from school, depending on it. And sometimes the food, I'm sorry, is, um, is not satisfactory. It doesn't meet what I think children need. Um, in Finland, I go there, I've been there a couple times to study. They have fresh food on a hot bar and children serve themselves, even at five because they want them to take what they need and take how much they want and not waste it. And I just think if we thought about children like Chisholm and we thought about kids that want fresh food and good food so they can grow up understanding uh, the difference between that and a frozen pizza that came from you know who knows where, uh, that our children would live better lives. Uh, we need to put policies in place in our schools that will lead to better nutrition, uh, better health care, um, and protect our children from, you know, eating junk, I'm going to say junk, uh, and not looking after themselves. So I'm excited to get a chance to work with, um, you know, the people on this panel and figure out how to make schools a place where food is attractive and exciting and uh, supports local farmers. Thank you. Steve Troxler. Through our food distribution division, we work with all the child nutrition directors across North Carolina to deliver the healthiest food that we can possibly get to the cafeterias. And uh, one thing that I can tell you that is unique in North Carolina is since we have this food distribution division, we're able to run a farm to school program where we are able to go directly to the farms, pick the products up as fresh as they can be, then deliver them to the uh, school cafeterias. And this helps fight uh, especially obesity from uh, kids eating uh, maybe food that's not so nutritious. And I mentioned uh, the money that we're gonna spend with, uh, uh, with small farmers markets. We wanna make sure that all of our small farmers markets uh, are healthy economically and innovative and be able to get uh, farm products directly to the public and, and make sure that this is a nutritional uh, diet that they do follow. Thank you. Yvonne Holly. Well, uh, first of all, I just think that I've, my heart has been broken uh, about uh, the kids now who are home that are food insecure. Uh, we have to look at the fact that so many of our children and students were getting their nutrition, the majority of their nutrition at schools. And uh, now that they are home and parents a lot of times budgeted for maybe one meal a day and are being forced to supply three meals a day. And I think our food banks have done a wonderful job and so many of our for nonprofits are trying to help fill that gap. I personally have been out there uh, at about six in my area uh, uh, assimilating food, uh, nutrient-rich foods to, to everyone. Uh, we need to, one of the things that we did do with the um, Food Desert Bill, when we started studying this system and looking at what North Carolina had, we had a committee and we realized at that time that North Carolina, there was millions of dollars in federal funds that were not being used for summer feed programs. Money that North Carolina can use to offer nutritious food during the summertime. And that is something that really good came out of that committee is that now so many other counties and officials are using that those funds to feed our students during the summer. But during the COVID, that even though there's money put in it, access is still limited. Uh, I am very concerned. And it's not just children now, it's also our elderly population that uh, are stuck at home and not able to get what they need. Thank you. Jenna Wadsworth. 
I think it's absolutely criminal that a state that's a major agricultural player, not just nationally, but on the international market, has child hunger rates of one in five. We can and we will do better. So in addition to working with federal partners to extend and reform the SNAP pro program so it actually is far more effective in serving our communities that need that help, that need that hand up, uh, right now in, in North Carolina, about 40% of SNAP recipients actually have children. So this is an issue that they're facing and this is a way that we can begin to reform the program and make a meaningful difference throughout North Carolina. I also have a plan to put a garden on every school ground. Uh, I think it's a great way to teach our children about where their food comes from to understand nutrition and horticulture and expand agricultural education programs. Uh, I've been endorsed by the teachers union so I know this is something that teachers are excited to get to work on. Uh, and in my role as a soil and water supervisor over the last 10 years we've made significant investments in environmental education programming because I know that our children have to live with the brunt of our inaction when it comes to climate change unless we begin to elect a leader who from day one is unapologetic in their commitment to addressing the climate crisis and part of that means looking at how that crisis affects agriculture and food insecurity. Uh, and you know I think that there's so many things we can do to, to change what the food desert landscape looks like. We can support our farmers markets, make sure that SNAP benefits are available there. And not just that, teach people who buy food from farmers markets how to actually use whole foods uh, effectively. Because a lot of, like uh, Dr. Mangrum referred to, a lot of folks are eating preservative and pasteurized foods at Dollar General's that are the only, the only stores available in their areas. Thank you. Josh Dobson will round us out. Thanks, Calvin, for the question. You know, I've thought about this a lot. What can the Labor Commissioner do to promote policies that address child hunger? And there's really two places that I think that the Labor Commissioner can best serve that role. First, as a member of Council of State, collaborating with the Commissioner of Agriculture, the Superintendent of Public Instruction, and obviously the Governor, to advocate for policies that address child hunger. But then in addition to that, the General Assembly and building upon the relationships that I have, both Republican and Democrat, to push for policies that addresses child hunger, uh, that addresses food deserts that Representative Holly talked about, that uh, increased appropriations for our food banks, that increased funding for free health clinics, that expanded access to care in underserved areas of our state. I think the Labor Commissioner, if done effectively, can advocate at the Council of State meetings, working with the Council of State, and then building upon those relationships that I have in the General Assembly, advocating for those very policies that does address child hunger, that we know that works. As Commissioner of Labor, that's exactly what I will do. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to question number three. And several of you brought up the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, according to 2018 data, over 42% of SNAP recipients, uh, SNAP participants in North Carolina are in working families. In other words, even though the adults work, they don't make enough to make ends meet and cover all their food needs. How will you address this disparity? And we'll start with Jen Mangro. So this is one that um, I'm, you know, I struggle a little bit with how, how schools will do this, uh, other than to have a strong education program so that everybody has an opportunity to have a good job, a decent living, and feed their family. But I can say I'm a mom. I'm a former teacher. I've watched Jessica Holmes in Wake County, that's where I live, hand out food to people. Um, I think we have to be role models for our community, that this isn't something anybody can solve individually. Um, Josh was right about, you know, working with the Council of State, but also I want to roll up my sleeves and get out there and help families and let them know that North Carolina cares about our, our families and their children. Um, children can't learn if they're not fed and they're going to be distracted and they're going to be um, weak and, you know, it's, it's Maslow's law. They have to be fed and they have to be healthy in order to learn. And I'm going to get out there and do all I can to have a healthy community and work with uh, Jessica and get that done in here in Wake County. Thank you so much. Uh, and then Steve Troxler. I think one thing that I can do as Commissioner of Agriculture is make sure that food is affordable. Uh, that means that agriculture has got to be efficient uh, and the food delivery system is there for all people to be able to take it advantage of. Uh, 
if the food needs are not met, we will continue to do what we've been doing. We will deliver the food to the food banks, to the feeding institutions. We will work with the face-based organizations to help them get through the hard times until they, they get to the point that they can once again meet their needs. But uh, we've been through the pandemic and I know this has been a, a terrible time for people, uh, especially those that lost jobs and that are uh, on, a, un, on unemployment insurance. So we're gonna do keep doing our part to make sure people are fed and they're fed nutritious foods. Uh, and I, I, but that efficiency in ag agriculture to have a safe, affordable food supply and an abundant food supply is going to be the key to the future. As we move into a time when this world is going to have, uh, they say, 10 billion people in it, uh, we've got to be able to feed them. And it's a moral responsibility that all of us in agriculture shoulder. Thank you. And Josh Dobson, if you'd jump in. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Calvin. Uh, being from Western North Carolina, we struggle uh, economically, we struggle geographically, and I've seen challenges even before the COVID-19 crisis. And then after it's just been exacerbated uh, exponentially. I, I think as labor commissioner, the best way to make sure that employees are safe and employers are prosperous is through collaboration and working with both employees and employers. That's the way I've tried to work in the North Carolina General Assembly to get things done. And I think it served, served me well. Uh, I'm proud of that work. And I think that same type of mindset is what's needed at the Commissioner of Labor's office to work in collaboration with employees and employers through training, through education. Uh, so you have that on the front end so you don't have accidents on the back end. That's the way that you keep people employed and that's the way that you keep employers and businesses prosperous so they can pay those workers what's needed. Thank you. Yvonne Holly. Well, I am just thrilled and delighted that you asked this question. And I wanna talk about a little bit off just beyond food here. Well, first of all, $7.50 an hour or minimum wage used to take care of one person. We are now asking whole families to live off of what other people would consider uh, of their lunch money. And we need to look at it as a holistic way. That it's not just food, it's food, it's housing. It's, uh, the, the family is falling apart because they've lost their jobs, they lost their health insurance, they, they're losing everything. And we need to go back to a holistic approach. And let's start by giving people a living wage, so then they are able to then buy enough food to take care of their families. It is critical. We need to go back to the basics and begin with level one. Thank you. Jessica Holmes. Agreed. Um, very well said, Representative Yvonne Holly. In some ways, the question answers itself. When I look at the statement, they do not make enough money um, to make ends meet. Um, the reality is that we need to increase the minimum wage. Um, it has remained stagnant while the cost of living has increased. And there are several things that North Carolina can do and that I can do as your labor commissioner, such as using my voice to fight for better wages for our workers. Also addressing and fighting for Medicaid expansion. Because when you look at things that, quite frankly, are putting many North Carolinians in debt, you look at affordable housing, you look at the cost of health care, you also look at issues related to inefficient transit systems across our state. Um, so we have to start with getting more money into the hands of our hardworking workers. And right now, you see so many people thanking essential workers. Well, they can't pay their mortgage with our gratitude and our appreciation. Uh, we need to pay them a living wage. We also right now, during COVID-19, greatest public health crisis of our lifetimes, we also need to ensure hazard pay for those workers that are lifting up our economy at this most critical time. Thank you. Jenna Wadsworth, if you'll close us out on question number three. People facing hunger in North Carolina are estimated in needing over 700 million additional dollars in order to cover their expenses and be able to put food on the table. 
uh, you know, I would, I don't, I don't think that we'll get any argument here when I say that in America, we've become accustomed to cheap, quick and easy when it comes to our food. Uh, we've seen so much consolidation in particular in the agricultural industry and so much consolidation of power and access and, and control of the, the, the meat pipeline and everything else, especially on the federal level. And as more small farmers have gone out of business, as they haven't had resources and new market opportunities, they haven't been able to thrive and be successful and help feed their families and, and fill in some of the void in these food deserts, uh, we're seeing people experience increased rates of hunger. And you know, it's it's hard to ask most folks to to shell out an extra dollar or two for locally grown, sustainably, ethically, morally produced food that costs a little bit more from their local farmers. Uh, when, as several of my colleagues have already alluded to, wages have largely been stagnant in this country since the 70s, which is also why I am in support of a living wage instead of just a minimum wage in this country. Uh, more than that, um, we have to talk about how healthcare is tied to employment. We have to extend an Band, Medicaid access, especially people in rural communities that don't have access to transit in order to get to a hospital or a high quality medical facility easily or quickly. Um, and so, you know, I think COVID-19 has shown us that the system is broken, but if we're being honest, it has been broken for a very long time for a lot of people. Thank you. Um, just want to make a note here. We know a few people have joined us uh, and we are in the middle of our conversation about farms, food, and hunger um, overall, uh, hearing from our candidates. Didn't want to apologize again for the translation issues, but we will make sure that uh, this whole session is transla translated and is available in Spanish. We're now in the middle. We're moving into question four out of five. And the next question is this, food system workers, specifically the Latinx community, have been disparately impacted by COVID-19 due to work environments, lack of access to healthcare and job loss. What steps will you take to address the short-term and long-term needs of food, systems work, food system workers and the Latinx community in particular? And we'd like to start with Jessica Holmes. I'll share a statistic that is very relevant across our state. Um, we know the realities that black and brown persons are disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, in Wake County, black and brown people make up about 34% of our population and about 70% of our confirmed COVID cases. Um, specifically, as it relates to Latinx workers, um, as it relates to agriculture, um, they face three among many other challenges, one being high, um, housing, as it relates particularly to migrant workers who are often working in um, and living in very close quarters where they're not allowed or unable to socially distance. Um, they are also um, less likely to have positions that come with health care benefits. Also, we all know the challenges all across our state hospitals are closing, um, which is very unfortunate considering that we're in the midst of a pandemic. Also, um, farm workers and Latinx workers are less likely to have paid leave. I can't tell you how many workers across our state have come to me with the challenge of, do they go to work, um, although they may have symptoms, or, or, or do they risk their lives in an attempt to make ends meet? Um, so many challenges that can be addressed by, one, ensuring safe and adequate housing for our migrant workers, ensuring they have access to PPE, and safe housing, but also going back to the realities of Medicaid expansion and ensuring that we have quality access to hospitals all across our state. Thank you. Jenna Wadsworth. I want to start with the acknowledgement that our Latinx farm laborers make up the backbone of the agricultural industry. And without them, we wouldn't be able to put food on our tables or clothes on our backs. So let's give them the respect and the dignity they deserve for making this industry work every single day. And, you know, it's what we're seeing right now is an absolute crisis point as more of these farm workers are contracting COVID-19. Um, the bulk of these farm workers and then the primarily uh, undocumented and overworked and underpaid migrant workers in our meat processing plants, well, they have not been provided adequate access to PPE by their employers, who a lot of them didn't put up glass shields uh, early on. Um, not just that, they have a very 
physically intensive, demanding job. Uh, and you know, they are working long, long hours. They either don't have access to healthcare, they're scared to take a day off of work because their H2A visa status could be put into jeopardy if they don't show up. They're scared to go to a hospital because they're scared that ICE will be staking that out and could round them up or their family. Um, and so we have to talk about the people who make this industry work. And I am someone who believes that our farm workers, our undocumented workers in, in ag, they deserve a moral pathway to citizenship. And I think that a truly great America would have already addressed the immigration crisis instead of treating it like a pest problem. Furthermore, as the effects of climate change continue to intensify and grow more frequent, we're going to see a flood of climate refugees coming to this country seeking shelter and looking for hope and opportunity. So it is absolutely critical that we treat people with the humanity they deserve. Thank you. Steve Troxler. Even though the Department of Agriculture has no regulatory authority for the plants, the large uh, pack, the slaughter facilities that uh, have been in the press, I've been very active and the department has been very active in trying to make sure that these workers have a safe working condition. Uh, I have been kind of a go-between between the large corporations, public health, uh, DHHS, we helped set up a program where there was a, uh, a team that went in to assess what more could be done, what, uh, what other CCC guidelines could be done. So we've been very proactive in working with the HHS, the health departments. Uh, I think we've made a difference. Uh, a, meat pack, a meat slaughter facility is no good if it doesn't have workers. And the workers are the, the people that do get the meat out of the plant and to the public. So we've been very, very proactive uh, with workers. And as far as our um, farm labor, we in North Carolina, for the most part, have H2A workers, which mean they live in inspected housing that is uh, federal guidelines and state guidelines. So we've also been very active to try to keep these workers healthy by such programs as uh, groceries being delivered to the farm. And uh, we, asked the, we have asked uh, DHHS to site test these workers as they come to North Carolina to prevent spread. Thank you. Josh Dobson. Thank you so much. Uh, this is one area that the Labor Department has direct oversight when it comes to the migrant housing. There's a lot that people that are not familiar with what the Labor Department does, but this is one thing that the Labor Department can do to address your question, to make sure that those migrant houses are as they should be. And that's what I will do as Labor Commissioner. With regard to health disparities and access to health care, there's a lot. Again, closing the coverage gap is something that I took a lot of heat for, but I supported that, and that has to be a part of it. But it has to be more than that. We have to support our public health departments, our free health clinics, our federally qualified health centers. Uh, we have to pay Medicaid providers to go into these areas uh, to where, where these workers are. And in addition to that, behavioral health is something that we've not talked about yet. That's critical. It's not just physical health that we have to make sure the funding is there. In this latest COVID bill, or the one before the most recent one that we just passed, we allocated $50 million for behavioral health across, in addition, in additional money across North Carolina. So again, there's not one thing, but there's a lot of little things that the Labor Commissioner can advocate for to address these things that you're talking about in your question, Calvin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jen Mangrum. Uh, yeah, we have a values problem, as I talked about before. Um, currently, we have a, a two education system. We have a system that supports our white children, and we have a system that neglects our black and brown children. Uh, one example, the General Assembly is responsible for curriculum. I don't know if many people know this, but if you look at the fourth grade curriculum, which is learning about North Carolina, there's a standard that says our students will value our monuments and a direct link to the Confederate statue in front of the Capitol. It doesn't ask them to know the stories. It doesn't ask them to look at the primary sources or the documents. And so we are leaving out the history and understanding of our black and brown children. We wonder why they don't have as many opportunities because we've set it up so they don't have as many opportunities. Um, how often do we see someone from the Latinx community or someone from the black community represented in our history books? Not a lot. 
So I think North Carolina, this food conversation is about why do some have and some have not? And why is our General Assembly not more concerned with those that have not? Uh, I would, next year, I want to rewrite the curriculum. I want our children to see themselves and know that they can and deserve more than what we've been giving them. Thank you. Yvonne Holly. Oh, okay, it's hard to be last again with so many good things to say, but let me talk about something that nobody's talked about. And that is the fact that inequity in just among the essential workers and the treatment and the respect that was given. Most of our medical uh, people in our hospitals were given uh, staying in hotels. We, we worked very hard to make sure they had the proper equipment and protection things that were done for them. And we uh, uh, kept them on the front line. People brought them food. People did everything they can and are still doing to make sure that our healthcare workers in particular are taken care of. We aren't doing that for people who are working our food systems. They should be protected. We should offer them first line of defense and, and at the slightest temperature of fever or anything that they get top quality health care. We should offer them hazardous pay. We should offer them all kinds of benefits, uh, even temporary housing that may be such that keeps them out of the compact situations that so many of them are because, uh, because they are the front line to all of us. They do what they do so we can do what we do. So it's just real important that we treat everybody equal and look at our food system workers and our plant workers and our grocery store employees and we treat and our Latinx community in particular with the respect that they deserve for being on the front line for us. Thank you. Jenna Wadsworth, uh, is uh, the first speaker on the next question. Um, and this one certainly has meaning for a lot of the folks in, in my family. We, uh, both sides of my family were farmers in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina has a long legacy of farms owned and run by African-Americans. There's a long history of discrimination against black farmers to the point that today only 4% of farm operations in the state are African-American owned. If elected, what will you do in the role of your respective office to support black farmers and other underserved farming populations, such as beginning farmers, female farmers, or small scale farmers in North Carolina? Jenna? I want to start by saying black lives matter, black farmers matter, absolutely, and without any caveats. And I encourage you to read the op ed that was published by the Fayetteville Observer that I wrote after June 10th, talking about the plight of our black farming community in North Carolina. Uh, black farmers in this country own one tenth of the land now that they did a century ago because of a dirty history of discrimination on part of USDA, the Farm Service Agency, predatory lending practices, or lack of access and awareness to the resources that would be available to them. I believe that we should support these small business owners and allow them to be successful in competing in our economy. Um, and I have been so excited to see so much community support galvanized around these black farmers markets over the last few, few months. But I'm also disheartened that a lot of the black farmers I talked to that went about um, creating these initiatives did so because they didn't feel welcomed or supported at the state run farmers markets. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement to, to do better uh, by, by uh, farmers who traditionally don't have a seat at the table. And we know that representation matters. Um, sometimes some of these voices aren't being heard in the Department of Agriculture. And I am someone who believes that you cannot effectively lead or govern from within an echo chamber where everyone else's experiences mirror your own. And so I'm about giving people a seat at the table, allowing them to be a part of this discussion. I actually um, have been speaking to black farmers since day one and we have been working on a targeted plan to change the future in North Carolina. Thank you. Invite Yvonne Holly in. Oh thank you so much for this question. You have such good questions this evening. Well first of all I would like to point out the fact that as a family, if you are in a family and one of your children is in need or is in sick. Sometimes you have to take extra resources and put it to that child. So that child is able, they're brought to the point of the other members of the family or they're made 
whole or well again. Well, that's what we need to do in some of these instances of discrimination and underserved communities. We need to do the investment in the problem. And if the problem is you are not getting them loans, if you're not helping them with the same things that the other farmers are having, then you need to do so. You need to make a special effort. It's like when you're teaching children in a school and, and someone is falling behind, you, you start a special program to enhance the education of those kids who are particularly in need. We need to do this for our farmers and bring them up to a level that they are and should be equal partners and being able to get the same kind of loans, the same kind of seeds, the same kind of treatment and contracts that everyone else is getting. Uh, it is a discrimination that uh, has happened across the world. It, is, it won't be solved quickly, but there are policies and procedures in place. And as your next Lieutenant Governor, I will do everything I can to make sure that attention are brought to these issues. And I will lobby my friends at the General Assembly to make sure that we can bring our farmers, our black and, and female and underserved small farmers up to a standard that a lot of the other farmers deserve and enjoy. Thank you. Jessica Holmes. I'll start by noting that feeding people isn't something that is a partisan issue. Um, as the next labor commissioner, I will use my voice on the Council of State to address some of the disparities that have already been acknowledged, such, that, such as the reality that many of our Black farmers don't have access to the resources that some um, non-minority um, farmers have access to. Um, one unique challenge in the Black community um, that is a legal term is heirs property. Um, we need to do a better job of ensuring that our black farmers know what their options are and that they are better protected from development and making sure that you know, they are able to keep their farms in their families and address those challenges. Um, I, we have a problem, we have a solution when it comes to food insecurity and food deserts. But yet we have black farmers who can't sell their produce. Um, this is one reason I will absolutely support uh, more farmers markets, particularly black farmers, and quite frankly, using their produce to address food deserts in what tends to be black and brown communities. So we, we have a problem, we also have a solution. We just need to do a better job of connecting um, those farmers with the needs that are already apparent in our communities. For example, ensuring those black farmers um, and those um, in their communities have access to their, the produce that they grow. Thank you. Steve Truxer, we'd like to invite you in. Within the Department of Agriculture, I have a small farm section that work almost exclusively with, uh, with black farmers, uh, farmers that don't have a lot of resources, small farmers, uh, each of these four employees are African American and they spend their time helping farmers uh, get through some of the federal programs that they don't understand. It's been unforgivable that in the past we had only 3% of minority farmers that were using federal programs. We're changing that. We work with a &T State University on their small farm program and the things that they do to work with uh, especially small and minority farmers. Uh, so we're trying to do our best. In fact, this morning I was at A&T State University uh, highlighting the small farm section and their small farm program. And we had, we had two minority farmers there uh, and it was so heartwarming warming to hear their stories about how we had helped them be successful in what they had endeavored to do and how they had grown over time. So that is the way that we are approaching, we're, uh, approaching this problem. We are helping. Uh, we do work exclusively with this group of people, so I'm very proud of this section. Thank you. Jen Mangrum. So look at my colleagues that are running with me. Yvonne Holly, Jenny, Jenna Wadsworth, Jessica Holmes, and myself. We are people of color and we are women. We understand the needs of those that are marginalized. If you want to help North Carolina, you need to select people who are as diverse as the population of North Carolina. One of my goals is to have an Office of Equity at the State Department um, of Public Instruction. So right from the beginning, we're gonna talk about race and racism. 
there's an ugly history that we have not been open to talking to. Um, black farmers are not um, doing poorly now because of something that happened yesterday. This has been a long standing, continuous concern. And whoever's been in charge up till now hasn't done anything. As an elementary teacher, a professor, I'm not running for power or notoriety. I'm running to make North Carolina better. And if you want to make North Carolina better, you need to pick people who want to see that North Carolina, all of North Carolina is represented. Um, I assure you that our children are going to grow up being better than we are and are going to leave the world better than we did. Thank you. Josh Dobson. Thank you. Uh, being an elected official doesn't make you an expert on everything. And some of the best pro policy proposals that I put forward come from listening. And I would want to visit those minority farms and listen to the concerns and listen to the issues that are being faced and listen to solutions that those that own minority farms have and then go about advocating and putting policies in the place that, that help them move forward. And that's what I would do. I would start by listening. And then after I listen, go about advocating for those policies that help those that most need it. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we are um, moving into closing statements for each of the candidates. Uh, and so we would ask Jenna Wadsworth to lead us off with uh, your closing statement. So again, my name is Jenna Wadsworth and I'm running to be your next North Carolina Commissioner of Agriculture to create a more sustainable, just and equitable future for every single person who calls North Carolina home instead of just a select few. I am running to be able to serve the more than 40,000 farmers in this state that get up and work hard every single day. And a lot of them are struggling and having a harder time now than what they were over a decade and a half ago. They are experiencing farm stress at record rates. Part of that's because we're not addressing climate change or recognizing that it's real. You can't just write a relief check that can't be our solution to dealing with every natural disaster. That's why I'm committed to creating a division within the North Carolina Department of Agriculture that works to specifically address climate change, resiliency building, looking at organic, renewables, how we connect urban farming, how we look at uh, the great research that A&T is doing, uh, HBCU that often doesn't get funding or the credit that it deserves. Um, I want to create new market opportunities. I want to reform the discriminatory hemp licensure process. I want to talk about legalizing cannabis, which could be a huge economic opportunity for our farmers and rural communities, as well as an opportunity to achieve true social justice for communities of color who are disproportionately locked up on the basis of possession charges versus Caucasian users. We're going to address food insecurity. We're going to talk about bridging the urban-rural divide through meaningful investments in rural healthcare and rural broadband, and I need your help to do it. Thank you so much. Josh Dobson. Yeah, thank you again, Farms, Food, and Hunger, for this conversation and this civil discourse, which I think we need more of. Uh, when I was the, the main job of the North Carolina Department of Labor Commissioner is to keep the employees of North Carolina safe. When I was putting myself through school, I worked as a correctional officer back in Western North Carolina. And we made a pact every day before we walked in that we would walk in together and we would walk out safely together. That's the same mindset and same focus that I wanna bring to the Department of Labor to make sure the employees of North Carolina walk in together and walk out together. Furthermore, in this, in this time of division, I think most people are hungry for a kind of politics that sets ideology aside and tries to bring people together and tries to find common ground. I think most of my colleagues in the house would tell you that's the way I've tried to govern in the state house, and that's the way I'll try to govern at the Department of Labor. My name is Josh Dobson. I am running for North Carolina Commissioner of Labor. Calvin and the whole group, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's been very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jen Mangrum. So I'm Dr. Jen Mangrum. I'm a candidate for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you to CFSA, the Feeding the Carolinas, Moms Rising, the Alliance for Health, the Rural Center, and the Rural Foundation. If I've missed anyone, thank you too. Who you choose for State Superintendent matters. 
Our children are our future. Um, we need to think about the curriculum that they're learning. We need to think about the classes they're able to take or not able to take. We need to think about um, how do we help them find their passion. Um, I want to do that, and I want to do it through the lens of equity so that each and every child has the opportunity to flourish. In order to do that, I need your vote. I promise you that my 14 years in the elementary school is gonna come through because I'm gonna take care of those kids, I'm gonna protect them, and I'm gonna make sure that North Carolina has the best education system in the country. Thank you, Dr. Jen Mangum. I look forward to hearing from you more uh, as we get on closer to November, and I hope I get your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Holmes. Jessica Holmes running for North Carolina Commissioner of Labor. I am the daughter of a laborer, um, a woman who made $7.25 um, for most of her time working at various meatpacking plants. Just like the meatpacking plants all across North Carolina where COVID-19 has been allowed to run rampant uh, with very few consequences, with oftentimes no inspections following up on complaints from workers. My mom set me on a path to be before you today as a non-traditional candidate. Thank you for giving me a seat at this table. And I hope to earn a seat at the table as the first person of color to ever be elected to the North Carolina Council of State. My mom sustained a workplace injury long before I understood the concept of workers' rights. My mission is simple, to ensure safe and healthy work environments for all North Carolinians. Your party affiliation does not matter. I want you to go to work and go home with the same 10 fingers and 10 toes that you went to work with. My mom was not given that opportunity. I wanna make sure that all of our workers across our state do. Jessica Holmes for North Carolina Commissioner of Labor. Thank you. Steve Truxler. North Carolina law requires that the Commissioner of Agriculture be a farmer engaged in their profession this year, I filed my 47th consecutive Schedule F on my federal and state tax return. If there ever was a time that we needed experienced leadership, it's now. This Department of Agriculture is recognized as one of the best, if not the best, Department of Agriculture in the country. And that's the reason I'm seeking this fifth term to carry out some of the exciting projects that we have got going including the North Carolina Agri-Science Center in Raleigh, a $120 million lab facility, uh, a, a specialty crops program that we have with NC State. Uh, and I want to carry out the programs that I mentioned that we have just got funded to the legislature. I ask for your support and I ask for your vote as a fifth term Steve Troxler, Commissioner of Agriculture. And Yvonne Lewis. Holly, excuse me. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to speak to people today who are concerned about the well-being of the human capital and the most valuable asset in North Carolina, its people. Uh, I look at the organizations that are doing this and you have, you have a variety of organizations who are participating. And here we have the opportunity to put wraparound services and take care of people in a holistic way. It isn't just about food. It isn't just about housing. It's about, uh, it isn't just about health care. It's about putting all that together and let's making North Carolina stronger. I have spent eight years in the North Carolina General Assembly as a gladiator fighting for Medicaid expansion and some of these battles. Yet, I have still worked across the aisle and gotten things done. I've gotten things done in the areas of food insecurities. Uh, because when you are hungry, you don't say, are you a Republican or a Democrat? You say, I need some food. And I have to say, I've been very successful at it. I will take those same skills to work with my colleagues in the House and my new colleagues in the Senate as the next Lieutenant Governor of the state of North Carolina. And I will work with organizations like you to, to help this come about. Now, to close it all out, I must say one thing. I'm not here to be something. I'm here to do something. And my doing is to help the people of North Carolina. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our candidates uh, as well. We are at the 815 mark. 
And we've gotten some amazing information from all of the candidates, but we also want information from the other folks who are part of this experience as well. So we've got two polls that we would like to put up now and get some information from you. So poll number one is asking simply, you know, when you think about the issues that were kind of put forward to the candidates overall, if you had to name the top two that the candidates should pursue if they're elected, which two would you pick? So it's up on the screen right now. Pick the two that you think uh, that they should uh, work on first. Food insecurity and hunger, child nutrition programs, black farmers, farm workers, food processing. We're getting some results back. Uh, by far, 77% food insecurity and hunger, uh, followed up by climate change with 41%. I think then we go to farm workers, food processing, and issues facing Latinx populations. I think then we go to COVID-19 with 24%. Black farmers at 19% and child nutrition programs at 15%. All right. Here's question number two. Um, and, you know, this is no, no big surprise. We want to know if you got what you needed from tonight. So has this forum better inform, help, uh, help to better inform you on how you're going to vote? Yes, no, or I'm not sure yet. Has this forum better informed you about how you'll vote? I love that they put up there that I can't vote. Um, maybe I have. Uh, here we go. Yes, 92%. Uh, a few folks are like, no, not really, 3%. Uh, and some people are just not sure. They're at 5% um, with that. Thank you all for participating in that. That helps us as well to understand a little bit about kind of where people are and what you've gotten. Um, as we've mentioned already, that as you close out of here, they'll come up a link uh, for some quick evaluation. So doing this virtually is difficult uh, and we want to get your feedback about what worked, what didn't work, what we could do better. So please fill that out if you can. You'll also, if you don't, uh, if you miss uh, filling it out with that link, it'll be emailed to you um, as well. Um, I also just wanted to, uh, in closing out the, the organizing team really wanted to make sure that we talked about the census and you know we uh, we know that currently 40 percent of north carolina households have not yet completed the census which represents an estimated four million north carolinians and over 7.4 billion in funding now you can complete the census by phone mail or on the internet by following the instructions on the slide right here also, you know, November uh, is coming faster than you think. It's really important to have a plan for how you're going to vote. Uh, so whether you're voting by mail or voting early or voting on election day, the key dates that you need to know about are on this slide. So please uh, keep track of that. And also just thanks to all the hours put in by our sponsoring organizations and everyone who participated. Um, I really want to name them because there are a lot of people who work very hard on this. Jessica Burroughs with Moms Rising, Brandy Bynum Dawson and Tiffany Gladney with the North Carolina Rural Center, Jared Cates and Nick Wood with Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, Mike Darrow with Feeding the Carolinas, Marianne Hedrick Wendt and Morgan Whitman Grauman with the North Carolina Alliance for Health. Jan Jones with Second Harvest Food Bank of uh, Northwest North Carolina. Erlene Middleton with the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. And Lisa Mish and Michelle Osborne with the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA. I also just really want to uh, thank Jenny Grant with the Rural Center for being our tech expertise, as well as Philip Sheldon for keeping us all on track tonight. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, please remember to fill out the evaluation. And again, thank you for being a part of this.
Take care, everyone.